So let me, um, let me begin with an overview of what I hope to cover. Um, unfortunately, I will probably have to erase this. Um, well, it can still be on the, on the board for, for, for just a, a little while longer, maybe. So, um, so the, the plan for today is to give an overview of the, the cosmic censorship conjectures in, in, in general relativity. So, outline. Did everybody see this, or should I write larger? It's OK? By the way, uh, how many of you have heard of the cosmic censorship conjectures in general? OK, so quite a few. OK, very good. Um, I will not assume that you will have, but in any case, it's a, it's a repetition is the mother of learning. Right? So, um, so after this overview, uh, the next uh, lecture, let's say, uh, will be a discussion of uh, spherically symmetric dynamical space times. So this is sort of a, a world which is very dear to my heart, and it's actually a, a world in which you can understand a lot of what's new and interesting in general relativity, and in particular, it's a world in which you can, you can really understand what, what's going on uh, concerning these conjectures, okay? So in some sense, my favorite way to really understand what, what the issues at stake are for these conjectures is really to understand this world. And another nice thing about this world is it's in a world where you can really make formal sense out of the notion of a Penrose diagram. So I'm going to add this here. So, and Penrose diagrams. So this is something that I'll use informally in today's lecture, and I know many of you have nodding familiarity with them, but in this context, we'll actually be able to sort of discuss these as sort of well-defined mathematical objects, and you can even state theorems just with pictures, so it's nice. Okay, um, so now I guess I'll actually have to rub out this nice outline, uh, starting. <laughs> so, uh, so the third, again, let's say, uh, lecture um, will be, uh, uh, in some sense, a continuation of this uh, second topic. So in, in the world of spherical symmetry, in, in the simplest case, that's to say one of a, of a self-gravitating scalar field, there's actually a complete proof of both cosmic censorship conjectures, the so-called weak and strong cosmic censorship conjectures, due to Stathulu. So I, I'm going to try to uh, devote a whole lecture to at least explaining those statements and a little bit what goes into the proofs. So, so we'll, we'll see these uh, acronyms a lot later, so I might as well initiate them already here. This is weak cosmic censorship and strong cosmic censorship uh, for spherically symmetric Self-gravitating scalar field, and this this work really is sort of the the place to start for anyone wanting to okay, understand more generally these conjectures. This is really the you know, this is what you have to understand. 
Uh, and uh, well, the, the, the final lecture will be um, concerning sort of a, a, a result which is uh, uh, beyond spherical symmetry, in fact, beyond any uh, symmetry uh, assumptions. And it actually sort of leads to a, a reformulation of strong cosmic censorship, or if you want, a sort of a, a disproof of the original version of strong cosmic censorship. Um, so this is a, a, a recent work of, uh, of um, myself and Jonathan Luke from, from Stanford University. Um, and, well, I'll just write the statement here, and later it will be clear what is its relevance for strong cosmic censorship. Uh, the, the story is a bit complicated, and it doesn't fit in a tweet or in this part of the board. Uh, so let me just write for now the C0 stability of the Kerr Cauchy horizon. So this is my plan. Uh, I, I think I'm giving four lectures, and these are four topics. Um, uh, although I have to warn you that, uh, so I'm from Greece, and I'm not so good in planning ahead. And so uh, it could be that the plan sort of disintegrates before our eyes. But in any case, this way you know what, what my plan was. OK, so, so let me begin uh, this uh, uh, overview. And by the way, feel, feel free to interrupt me at any time. But also, if, if you don't quite understand everything yet, that's fine. You shouldn't. Because the whole point, uh, in some sense, of topic two is topic two will, in particular, explain formally, in a certain world, everything I said today. Okay? But in any case, uh, nonetheless, do feel free to, to, to stop. So, um, so let's begin our overview. So, cosmic censorship conjectures. So, okay, what what are these conjectures about? Okay, so um, so these these conjectures, sort of the very big picture, whatever they're about, they're they're about the nature of singularities that form dynamically in general relativity. Okay? At the end of the day, both, both of these conjectures, you should think of them about as being about the nature of singularities as they form dynamically. Okay. So I want to focus for a second on the, that last word, dynamically, because uh, until you formulate these questions in terms of dynamics, you will not be able to rationally study them. So before you say anything about these conjectures, you have to understand the notion of dynamics in general relativity. So let me uh, sort of review that very briefly. Uh, possibly this has already been discussed a bit last week. And actually, I know that Harvey Real, his lectures will be about the initial value problem in, well, not just in classical GR, but beyond classical GR. So in any case, that. This is something very important. Without dynamics, we could not talk rationally about it. So let me, fully dis deserving, deserving, sorry, of a, of a bullet point. So dynamics. So, um, so what is, what is uh, dynamics? Well, uh, let me first uh, discuss the, the vacuum. So for the vacuum equations, Ricci curvature equals zero. Okay. We learned that there is, there is some notion of initial data. And initial data is a, is a three-manifold, which I've drawn here. Okay. So it's some three-manifold okay. with a Riemannian metric okay. and with a second fundamental form, or what will be the second fundamental form. And maybe you heard uh, last week that you know, these actually are not completely free. They, they have to satisfy these constraints. And that's a nuisance in the theory various people uh, study. 
So, um, so the fundamental theorem of, of dynamics, which is due, of course, to Yvonne choquet from 1952, uh, is that uh, given sufficiently regular such initial data, you, you can solve these equations. Okay? So what does that mean? Uh, there, there exists a... Lorentzian uh, four manifold, okay, that that satisfies these equations, okay, um, and uh, admits this uh, three manifold as a as a hypersurface, which is space-like, right, and uh, such that this is the induced first and this the induced second fundamental form, okay. Um, moreover, uh, and and this is actually uh, important for. <laughs> for being able to talk about dynamics. Um, so the way I said you know, what it means for a, a spacetime to solve this initial value problem, then solutions are severely non-unique. Okay? Because you could always then take a, sort of a, a type of subset of this, and this would also solve the initial value problem. Or maybe you could take another spacetime which is a bit bigger in one direction. That also solves. So, um, so actually, uh, in, in, in 1969, uh, Bob Garrosh and uh, Yvonne Choquebra, uh, they were able to show that there, there exists a maximal Cauchy evolution. So there exists a maximal solution. So There exists a maximal Cauchy development of okay. So uh, so this uh, object is is globally hyperbolic. So globally hyperbolic means that all inextendable causal curves in the space time they intersect the initial. Uh, sigma 3 once and only once, okay? And it is the largest globally hyperbolic solution of this initial value problem in the sense that any other solution embeds isometrically into this. So, um, so anyway, uh, I, I can't emphasize more how from the point of view of language this object is absolutely fundamental in rationally discussing all problems in dynamics in general relativity. Because you should think that any, any problem, essentially, in dynamics is a problem of connecting properties of initial data okay, to properties of this object. All right? any, any question in general relativity, essentially, can be, can be phrased in, in, in that way. Okay. Um, so, uh, I can't resist saying a, a, a certain uh, side story that um, actually the, the, the proof of this uh, theorem uh, by uh, Bob Garrosh and, and, uh, and Yvonne choquet Bra in 1969 actually appealed to Zorn's lemma. So if, if you know what that is, that's, uh, that's one of the equivalences of the axiom of choice. So that uh, sort of uh, already may hint that uh, it's non-trivial to, to construct this object. And the reason is that if you, if you have two globally hyperbolic developments, then they're not sitting, they're not living on the same manifold. So it's not clear how to compare them a priori, which is bigger. And that sort of is, um, is essentially why one, one had to appeal to, to Zorn's lemma. Uh, that, for, for, those of, for those of you who, who like uh, the philosophy of, of physics, uh, you don't have to identify yourselves. Um, but for, for, for those of you, uh, the, you might think that that's actually quite problematic because if, if indeed, you know, talking about dynamics in general relativity relies on the axiom of choice, you might be sort of worried. Um, so actually, a, a, a bright young uh, uh, graduate student in, in Cambridge a few years ago, uh, Jan Zbierski, uh, he uh, succeeded in desornifying this proof. So actually, this, this proof is now completely constructive. And, and his, um, uh, so I don't remember the year of that, so let me guess that it was 2015. 
Um, so, so actually, his his paper on this is, I think, also the best reference uh, to to discuss sort of you know this proof from a modern point of view. Okay, so. Um, so that's great. I've paid lip service to, to dynamics, and we will certainly see in use uh, this object uh, later on. Uh, and we will, we will see the significance of global hyperbolicity uh, later on. So if you don't think you have a sense for what it means, don't worry. Sort of everything will become much clearer in, in lecture two. OK. So that's. Uh, that's the first thing we have to pay lip service to say anything. Um, so, um, so we have a notion of dynamics. So the second thing that we have to remember, uh, and again, we can only say these words because of dynamics, is that uh, bad things happen to good data. OK? So let me write this thing. Bad things happen. So, um, so uh, okay. So, what 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 do I mean? So, uh, this is data, okay. So, uh, the first thing that okay, you 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 can know this in this framework is that there are space times where the data is impeccable. There's nothing wrong with the data. The data is complete. It's asymptotically flat. It's there's, there's no singularities in the data. In fact, the data can be you know, very nearly flat in some sense, very, very close to Euclidean space. And yet, bad things happen. So happen always means the maximal Cauchy development of the data. The maximal Cauchy development of the data has bad, in quote, properties. Okay? So, uh, so this, if you want, you, you already see this from the explicit solutions that we know and love. Um, so Schwarzschild, um, something which I'll talk about later, Oppenheimer Snyder, in which it's even more clear, in some sense, the you might quibble that the the the, the data in Schwarzschild or or Kerr. Let me also add Kerr. Uh, okay, it's complete, it's asymptotically flat, but it has a funny topology, so maybe you don't like that. So here in Oppenheimer Snyder, which I'll show you very soon, uh, you can't quibble about anything. Um, so, so, so bad things happen to, to good data. And again, ah. it means it's the biggest. It's the biggest. So it's the biggest solution with this property. And biggest, because again, you can't compare a priori. So biggest means any other one isometrically embeds to this one. So any other one, so any M tilde, okay, G tilde, which is globally hyperbolic, okay, and admits sigma G bar K. Okay, as a sort of a, a hypersurface with induced data as a Cauchy surface, okay? any other one uh, isometrically embeds into M comma G. Okay, so that this diagram commutes. All right, so um, so to get back here, so 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 bad things happen to 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 good data and. Uh, again, keep in mind, especially with the discussion of, let's say, Schwarzschild, okay? Um, you see, in, in the antediluvian discussion, and I mean before the relevance of dynamics uh, sort of was clear, uh, then uh, people saw Schwarzschild, they saw that it was singular. Actually, there was a lot of confusion of what was singular, and et cetera, but let's even gloss over that. They saw that it was singular. And many people's reactions, including uh, Einstein, was that, OK, that just means we should throw this solution out. Okay? And 
okay, it's, it's sort of a, a reasonable thing to do in, in theories which are not governed by dynamics. But the point is that uh, you're not allowed to throw, you cannot uh, sort of throw out the maximal Cauchy development just because you don't like one of its properties. You can only throw out the initial data. That's to say, you know, judgment calls can only be made on the level of initial data. Okay? And the initial data is, is, is flawless. Okay? And it's not singular. So somehow, the, the understanding that dynamics is the important problem, it fundamentally sort of changed the, the, you know, the point of view of, of, of these solutions. Okay. Anyway, all this will become clear later, but it's worth saying this sort of philosophy at the beginning because, you know, anyway. Okay, bad things happen to good data, but, uh, but the story gets worse. And uh, the, the reason that the story gets worse is that, uh, again, these here, so Kerr, of course, was discovered later than Schwarzschild and this Oppenheimer-Snyder that I'll talk about. Um, so, uh, so these solutions, of course, they were discovered rather early, this one in, already in, actually in, in December 1915, uh, this in, in 1939, as we'll see in just a second. Um, and, okay, from the point of view of dynamics, they exhibit this, this principle. But, of course, these are just some explicit solutions. And you might hope that the, the reason that bad things happened was because these uh, solutions are very symmetric. Okay? So, uh, so even though, indeed, bad things happen to some very particular good data, at, at this point, you could still be hoping that for generic data, bad things don't happen. Okay? And this was very much the, the, the hope in the early 1960s. And the hope was completely destroyed in, in 1965 by, by Roger Penrose. Okay? So, um, so Penrose, um, um, what he showed in 1965 is the following. So, um, so th these, uh, these three solutions, they have various bad properties. They have, uh, in, in this case, they have singularities. Whatever. They have various types of bad properties, okay? or what were, in, in any case, considered to be bad properties. Okay? But one thing that they have in common is that they are geodesically incomplete. And what, what Penrose uh, uh, showed in 1965 is that uh, geodesic incompleteness is, is stable to perturbation. Okay? That if something is true, and this something is, is actually true in all these examples, then geodesic incompleteness is stable. So to perturbation of what? To perturbation of initial data. Because again, to, to make sense of all these things, you have to always refer to dynamics. It's stable to perturbation of initial data. So, um, so again, to go back to this picture, what, what, uh, uh, what is the claim? So all these, okay, you can think of them as solutions of the problem of dynamics with some special initial data, okay? So uh, the result of Penrose says that if you wiggle ever so slightly the initial data, okay, and you solve the Einstein vacuum equations, or, well, in this case, more complicated system of einstein mather equations that we'll see in just a second. So you consider the maximal Cauchy development of wiggled initial data, okay? Then the wiggled initial data will still be geodesically incomplete. Okay. So, um, so this uh, theorem is traditionally in the literature known as Penrose's singularity theorem. But it, it is time that that terminology be retired and that it be called what it is, namely Penrose's incompleteness theorem. 
okay? Because that's actually what it says. So, And it, it will be clear later on why, I, I, okay, this is just semantics, but why this is a much more useful semantics, okay? Um, so, um, so, so, to recap where we are so far after these three bullet points, um, uh, the fundamental problem is one of dynamics. Bad things happen in dynamics to good data. Those bad things, or some bad thing, namely incompleteness, uh, is stable to perturbation. So it wasn't because the data was symmetric. It wasn't because the data was, was fine-tuned. Okay? These bad things, they actually happen sort of generically, or they happen sort of with non-zero, quote, probability. So maybe I should say it like that. Okay. So where does that leave us? Well, this is now where enter the, the cosmic censorship conjectures. So the cosmic censorship conjectures, they enter to make the best out of a bad situation, okay? So cosmic censorship, what is it all about at the end of the day? So it's about uh, making the best of a bad situation. Okay? And if, 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 if you want, uh, what, so let me make a, a sort of a quote uh, to carry on um, from here, and we'll, we'll, we'll understand in stages this quote as we go along. So the statement basically is, given the above situation, okay, uh, classical GR, okay, is as good as it gets. So let me say it like that. But there's one little caveat, and that caveat, I'll write it here, um, generically, okay? So with probability one, let's say it like that for now. Okay. So, um, so that's um, so. So that's what uh, cosmic censorship is 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 supposed to be about. Uh, and let me immediately um, sort of try to give a, a, a first. Okay, this is not even a formulation. This is what is. This is okay. A quote connecting to both cosmic censorship conjectures, because as we will see, there are two sort of cosmic censorship conjectures. And then, uh, as time goes on, we will put meaning to these quotes. So, um, okay, so maybe I'll move back here now. Ah. Yes? Say again? Yeah, so there was not, so that's a good point. That, 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 yeah, so the question was that uh, it, it, uh, if, if you take 1965 and you subtract 1969, you get the number which is negative. <laughs> and so did he use closed timeline curves? I think this was the question. Um, so the, 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 the theorem was not, uh, uh, it was not originally formulated uh, with, 
respect to the maximal Cauchy development, because of course that notion didn't exist. In fact, Penrose's theorem, one of its, its great strengths is that it's actually a, a, a purely geometric fact, so it's not even about a solution to a PDE. In fact, it's, sort of, it's, it's about a solution to a, a partial differential inequality. Um, but uh, somehow in, in, in order to uh, interpret the theorem, it turns out that the, the natural object to interpret it to is the maximal Cauchy development. Because if, if you are not interpreting it with the maximal Cauchy development, then all this is saying is that, well, you know, maybe, maybe you should extend further. So somehow it, it is really the, you know, the sort of, indeed, you should really think of this as a corollary of Penrose's uh, incompleteness theorem, but this is actually the corollary that, that has content for sort of for classical GI. It's a good point. Okay, so, um, so this is sort of the, the quote. This is what the cosmic censorship conjectures are supposed to be about. So let me try to make this slightly more specific. Uh, referring to both these sort of separate statements. Um, so the, the first cosmic censorship conjecture, so this was actually the original cosmic censorship, and uh, it's now called weak cosmic censorship to differentiate it from something else, which is called strong cosmic censorship. But if you look back at the literature, this is what used to be just called cosmic censorship. So what, what does this uh, conjecture uh, try to say? So again, I'll, I'll, give you a, uh, I'll give you a quote. So let me save the quotations for the, for the quote. Um, so, so this conjecture says the following. Despite the fact that the maximal Cauchy development may be incomplete, as Penrose's theorem tells us, faraway observers whatever that means, and we'll make that precise later, faraway observers uh, live forever. Okay? So faraway observers, which you should think of as sort of <coughs> geodesics that are far away, in some sense of that word, okay, they are complete. Okay? So in particular, they never see anything that deserves to be called a singularity in finite time. So this is, if you want, the, uh, the uh, original form of, of the conjecture. And or, well, the original informal form of the, of the conjecture. And one thing that actually really somehow first came out from, from uh, Stolulu's work in, in spherical symmetry, uh, because this really is, a, is an impeccable model problem, uh, is that uh, this, uh, one doesn't expect this is true without adding the caveat generic. So, yes, you have incompleteness, okay? But generically, there's this class of observers, the so-called faraway observers, and they, they live forever, okay? And they, they don't, in particular, they don't see any singularities in finite time. So, um, so as, as we'll see, this is, this is a property which is shared by all of these uh, examples, okay? So, if you want, it, it, it's motivated by what we see in, in the black hole space times that we know and love. So that's weak cosmic censorship. And what is strong cosmic censorship about? So this is sort of harder to explain in a quote, and it will hopefully become much, much clearer when we, we start uh, looking at examples and drawing Penrose diagrams. But uh, nonetheless, I, I guess I should write something. So uh, one comment I should immediately make is that these uh, names are actually quite unfortunate um, because uh, this is not a weaker 
statement than what I'll, I'm going to write here. Uh, in fact, uh, what I'm going to write here, the way I'll write it, it will look as if it has nothing to do with this. Of course, there are relations between these statements, and there are reasons why, you know, the historic reasons why they, they have these two names. But um, if, if it were possible to retire these names, uh, then uh, maybe we would, and I, I, could, I could imagine... Um, better names for both of these conjectures. On the other hand, these are very cool names that have stuck, so I wouldn't, uh, I, 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 I'm not uh, uh, supporting retiring this. Uh, uh, here it's different, and the reason is that, in fact, there's nothing wrong with an incompleteness theorem. After all, Gödel proved an incompleteness theorem, and it sort of, he's a great guy, and I don't think anyone thinks less of him because it was an incompleteness theorem and not the singularity theorem. So I don't, I mean, I, I really think this, this semantic should stick. Uh, here uh, we can, okay, well, I will keep these words, but we should, maybe it, it is good to sort of remember that they're not maybe so great. So what is this uh, conjecture? What does it say? So it says the following. So generically, again, and I'll tell you a little bit about the history in this context of the word generically. Generically, the, um, well, maybe I'll say it like this. All incompleteness is due to singularity. Let me say it like this. So uh, this actually goes right to the heart of this distinction, okay? So, um, so uh, Penrose's uh, theorem, commonly thought of as a singularity theorem, is, is actually just telling you that space-time is geodesically incomplete. And there can be many reasons why geodesically, a space-time is geodesically incomplete, one of them being that it sort of has an edge which is everywhere a singularity. But that's not the only way that spacetimes can be geodesically incomplete. And somehow what strong cosmic censorship uh, is saying is that generically, that is why spacetime is geodesically incomplete. It's incomplete because of singularity, because its edge is singular. So uh, you might think that it'd be very, very strange at this point that this be thought of as something good. But I claim to you, and this will only become more clear for those of you who don't uh, know the story, uh, when, okay, when we really understand the uh, ramifications of you know, this not being true. Um, uh, so, so this is good, okay? And in fact, secretly, okay, this is the statement that um, um, general relativity uh, uniquely predicts the classical fate of classical observers. So let me write it like this. So this secretly is, is somehow the statement that, that classical uh, general relativity in its regime uh, is deterministic. Okay. Anyway, why that is the case might not be clear yet, but it's hopefully will be as, 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 as time goes on. So, uh, so secretly, if you want, uh, in, a, in a more, for those of you who are sort of uh, more, ah, there's a question. Yes. Well, I, so actually, the yeah. So 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 the question was, uh, why all the fuss about geodesic uh, completeness? So so the answer is actually, uh, you sort of so uh, uh, as we as we shall see, in some sense, the 
Okay. It is not... So, geodesics are convenient because, okay, these are sort of unquestionably, you know, good objects. So, okay, they're, they're a convenient test of various things. But certainly, you know, the, okay, the... We can talk about uh, classical physics of fields without ever mentioning uh, geodesics, okay? Um, and if you want the, the, the sort of the rigorous formulations of, of uh, these statements, they don't uh, sort of refer to, to geodesics manifest. So the, they actually find their uh, proper formulation just as, you know, in the world of the Einstein equations coupled to a billion sort of fields. So everything is, is in the solution. To, to pick it, to say it another way, in classical physics, you don't, you know, you don't need things from outside the, you know, the universe in order to measure the universe. Everything is in the universe, okay? So, uh, in particular, in, 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 in classical general relativity, okay, we study the vacuum equations, and more generally, the vacuum equations coupled to a billion fields, okay? And everything is there. So the observers, they're also there. They're, you know, they are one of the fields, let's say. Okay. And so, so actually, the, the proper way to say all these questions are as properties of that system of PD. So you, you, fundamentally, you don't have this issue that, okay, maybe you have in quantum physics, that, okay, you have to talk about what, what is a, an observation. In classical physics, it's all, it's all in the system of PDs. So all the, the questions fundamentally are statements about the, the system of PD. So when we appeal to observers and time-like geodesics, it's just some limit of that system. So it's just something to help us. Okay? But the, the, the primal formulation of everything is in a pure physics of fields, because, that's, because this is classical physics. Well, I, I, by which theorem? By, by, well, the, first of all, these, uh, these are not theorems. <laughs> these, these are conjectures. Well, again, uh, if it can, but, you know, Minkowski space can also have sort of, you know, uh, such curves. I mean, sort of, you know, the fact that such curves exist, it's just a fact of life. Okay, and it has some, you know, it has some uh, interpretation. I mean, that's not sort of, that, that, okay, that, that, that's not uh, uh, inconsistent or in contradiction with anything. All right. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we, we'll see sort of a lot of these properties and a lot of these subtleties actually in, when I talk about, um, actually, well, hopefully very soon. Okay, so, okay, let me, let me try to put a little more uh, meat in, into this by giving you uh, what really you should think about as the sort of main um, model for gravitational collapse, at least historically, that sort of, if you want, sheds light on, you know, what, what, what these statements are really saying. And this is Oppenheimer Snyde, okay? So let me introduce to you Oppenheimer Snyder. And if I get something wrong, there's at least one member of the audience who can help me out. So So this was 
uh, first written down in a, in a paper uh, from 1939. Um, it was not presented uh, in any sense in the way I'm going to present it. Actually, this uh, solution in some sense is already implicit in the work of Lemaitre from, from a few years earlier, and it was from that work that it sort of eventually... Yes? Oh, sorry? Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, it, in some sense, this it is already in... in, in um, In Lemaitre, um, so Lemaitre was the first person to understand the, that the, the event horizon of, of Schwarzschild was not singular. And in fact, uh, the reason he was thinking about that was sort of because he was thinking about dynamical spacetimes, dynamical spacetimes in cosmology, but there is this connection with, with gravitational collapse, and he sort of, so he already describes sort of this solution, he doesn't sort of write, write it down explicitly. So somehow the, there is, um, um, that, that's somehow where, it, where it's actually uh, uh, originating from. Anyway, um, so, um, so what is this a solution of, first of all? So this is not a vacuum, this is a solution of the Einstein equations coupled to, uh, 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 well, you can think of it as, as a perfect uh, fluid where there's no pressure, however. So we often call this a, a dust, okay? So that's, uh, I guess, the energy momentum tensor um, is uh, equal to this, where, where uh, rho is uh, pressure. Um, and moreover, it is, a, it is a solution of this system which evolves from very uh, special initial data, uh, initial data that looks as follows. So, um, so the initial data is, is, is spherically symmetric, first of all. So if you want, I can think that I have a, a, a coordinate r, okay, that goes from zero. This is what I think about as a, a radial coordinate r, okay, which goes from zero to infinity. So this is time equals zero, okay, and uh, so the, the initial data is perfectly symmetric, but moreover, um, it's actually uh, homogeneous in some finite ball. So I have some R equals capital R, okay? And in this ball, I have rho, the density, constant, and outside this ball, I have rho equals zero. So this is the initial dot. So if you want, this, I can think of this as a, a, the initial state of a star, okay? So this is the data Okay, so how does it evolve? Okay, so to uh, draw the space time that evolves, what I'm actually drawing is a Penrose diagram. Okay, of course, these type of drawings did not exist at, at the time, but in any case. So, uh, so I'll just use this now as a, as, a, as, a, as a picture, and those of you who already you know, have nodding acquaintance can nod. And, uh, well, those of you who don't, well, this will be motivation for understanding uh, tomorrow's lecture, where in the context of spherical symmetry, I'll tell you exactly what these objects mean. Okay. So, um, so the evolution, it turns out that it looks like this. So the, if you want, the, the, the surface of the star, okay, follows a, a path like this in, in, in space time, okay, and uh, eventually reaches a, a singularity where r equals zero, okay. And, of course, outside of the support of the star by Birkhoff's theorem, okay, 
Uh, see, outside the support of the star, the solution is vacuum, but spherically symmetric, so it has to be Schwarzschild. And many of you have already seen the, the Penrose diagram of, of Schwarzschild. Okay? So this is the boundary at infinity known as null infinity. Already, you should be thinking this is related to far away observers in the radiation zone. Okay. The past of future null infinity is bounded by uh, a horizon known as the event horizon. And, okay. So the, the, the complement right, of the past, the future null infinity, is this region here. This is exactly the black hole region. And, um, uh, and so we have, uh, we have this picture. Okay. So, um, so you should think that, by the way, maybe I'll label this, that r equals infinity in some sense on this boundary. Okay? So we'll understand exactly how and why and whatever. Next lecture. All right, so this, this is the, 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 the Penrose representation of, um, of Oppenheimer Schneider. And let me try to interpret now this picture, okay, in the terms that I talked about here. Okay, so you'll understand sort of. So the, the claim is that this picture exhibits both um, this property here, okay, and this property here, okay? So Oppenheimer Schneider, if you want, is the model par excellence for sort of what we want to be true generically in evolution in general relativity, okay? So let's see why, okay? So, um, so of course, uh, again, uh, just to make a sort of historic point, um, so very often when one talks about um, weak cosmic censorship, the way one would think about it, in, again, in slightly antediluvian days, was as follows. So this boundary here is a singularity. Okay, we'll get back to that in a second. And this singularity is cloaked by a horizon. This is horizon, okay? Remember, the horizon is just the past of, the, the boundary of the past of future null infinity. This is future null infinity. This is its past. The horizon is the boundary of the past, okay? And the singularity is sort of cloaked uh, by the horizon in the sense that observers who are outside the horizon, okay, if they remain outside the horizon, they don't encounter the singularity. But, um, but actually, uh, it's sort of, um, and this uh, insight in some sense goes back to uh, Bob Garrosh and Gary Horowitz in Gary Horowitz's thesis, is that um, you should, you know, to, to capture the, the property that we're interested in, you should actually focus on future null infinity itself. Because, um, because actually, um, you know, the statement after all that observers who remain outside the event horizon don't encounter a singularity is meaningless if all observers eventually cross the event horizon. So uh, what you really want to say is that there is a class of observers, okay, who do not encounter the singularity. That's really what you want to say, okay. So, um, so all right, one thing that you might want to, uh, one way you might want to say it is talk about, find certain classes of time-like geodesics, et cetera. But then you run into this problem, which is partly related to your question of, you know, which geodesics and why, whatever. So, uh, so actually, it, it turned out that the cleanest way of thinking about this is thinking of the completeness as a statement that lives at null infinity. Okay? So, uh, so uh, I claim that you can make sense to the following words, that future null infinity is complete. Okay? So, um, 
So this is a funny statement because, okay, whatever future uh, null infinity is, it, okay, it looks like it is asymptotically a null hypersurface. And of course, you can't talk about the, the length of null curves because the length is zero no matter how long they are, okay? But nonetheless, um, I claim, and we'll, we'll discuss it next time, that you, you, can, you can actually make sense of these this words, okay? And, um, well, a very pedestrian way to understand it for the experts is that if you normalize in a geometric way a retarded time coordinate, okay, along null infinity, then the, the range of this coordinate will be from minus infinity to plus infinity, okay? But you have to normalize it geometrically, that's the point, okay? So you should think of it as meaning that, you know, very far away observers, they, they live forever in both pos positive time here and negative time there. Another way of thinking about it uh, sort of related to the meaning of null infinity. So you should think that null infinity is actually where gravitational wave experiments take place. So another way of thinking of this is that those experiments can go on for as long as they're funded. Okay? All right. So this, so if you want, this is what, what weak cosmic censorship is, is telling you that for now generic initial data for the Einstein vacuum equations and for a good class of Einstein mother systems, and which class we'll have to discuss later, uh, future null infinity is something that one should be able to define and it should be complete. Okay. So that's, that's this statement. Okay. Um, so what about strong cosmic censorship? So, um, so first of all, uh, Although this is uh, complete, this space time is geodesically incomplete. In fact, it turns out that uh, there is, ah, there is colored chalk. It turns out that all, let's say, time like geodesics, which cross the event horizon, okay, they will be incomplete. Okay? And in fact, in finite time, they are going to reach this boundary where r equals zero. So this is geodesically um, incomplete. And in fact, um, one way to show that this is geodesically incomplete is, of course, to do this computation, which is not so difficult. Uh, it's probably the easiest. But another way is to notice that um, any sphere here, so in, if you think these are r equals, you know, these are sort of spheres of, of, of some r value, okay? So this is a sphere in Schwarzschild, actually, because this is outside support of the mother. And well, if you know your Schwarzschild metric, then um, you'll realize that this sphere is something called a trapped surface. And that's exactly what you need to apply Penrose's incompleteness theorem. Okay? So you, you sort of, from the fact that this is a trapped surface, you know, and the fact that this is a globally hyperbolic sort of evolution, okay? It has to be because I told you that this was the maximal Cauchy development. So, this, so I can apply Penrose's theorem. Uh, uh, this must be incomplete. So you, you somehow Penrose's theorem already told you that this was incomplete. And I, I remark that if you want for a reason. Okay. So let me just maybe, since I bothered to say this is a trapped surface. Trapped surface. So Penrose already tells you Okay, um, so, um, okay, but anyway, um, so this is an incomplete geodesic, okay? And what, what, what happens, as I just told you, is that all, um, all incomplete geodesics, so I just drew a bunch of them, they end up at r equals zero. Now, what's written in, in all of the textbooks is that r equals zero is a Curvature singularity, that's what's often said. So the, the, the curvature blows up. So for instance, just so that that's unambiguous, you can look at the, the, the Kretschmann scalar, which is a, it's a quadratic 
uh, expression in the Riemann curvature tensor, which is scalar, okay? And that, that blows up as, as R approaches zero, okay? So um, that's great, of course, but um, the, the fact that the curvature blows up does not do justice to the nature of this singularity. Because in reality, uh, the, the singularity in, uh, uh, so by the way, this I should mention is true both of these geodesics, okay, who sort of approach R equals zero in the Schwarzschild region, and these geodesics who approach R equals zero, you know, always inside the star, okay? So the curvature blows up, but this does not begin to do justice to how singular this boundary is. Um, so um, in reality, not only does the curvature blow up, but um, observers are torn apart these observers by infinite tidal deformations. So um, what does this mean? This means that if I'm a, 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 so let me say it first in this language of observer. So if I'm a, an observer, so I'm, I'm, I'm following one of these geodesics, but I also have hands and, and legs, okay? And if you want, you can think of the hands and legs as uh, Jacobi fields. You know your differential geometry. Because my, the ends of my hands and of my legs, they also follow geodesics, okay? Which are infinitesimally close to sort of where my heart is, let's say. Okay? So, um, so if you look at the, the, the hands and the legs, then depending on their orientation, they are infinitely stretched or infinitely compressed as I approach R equals zero. So I'm killed as an observer. This is very different from just the statement that curvature blows up. That, that's, a, that's an instantaneous force, okay? That's just a, a, an instantaneous force, which is infinite. So if I just know this, Okay, then uh, no one says that I am killed as a classical observer. Okay, but this statement here tells me that, that, that I'm killed. So, um, but again, in the spirit of that question, can, can, can I say these two statements without referring manifestly to observers just in the language of the field? Okay, so can I, can I somehow capture these statements just in the language. Yes, question. So, can there be curvature blow up? Yes, of course. Yeah, and we will see this later on. Okay. So, um, so actually, this uh, this uh, it's sort of funny. So, I think the the first person to to, to claim this statement was was Roger Penrose, but uh, he actually doesn't show it, and the first calculations sort of that show this in some sense are actually in Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler. So there's a, there's, a, there's a section of Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler about this. Okay. So, um, so how can you say this without referring to observers just in terms of the metric? Well, the, the, the statement that the, the curvature blows up as observers approach R equals zero, uh, that's very easy to say in terms of the metric. This is just the statement that the metric So um, the curvature blows up so this is just saying that the, the let's say it like this that the, the Lorentzian manifold m comma g okay is inextendable as a manifold with C2 metric. So C2 means 
twice continuously differential. Okay? So that's very uh, easy to uh, infer because, of course, uh, suppose you could extend. So here's a little bit of an extension. Okay? Then very elementary geometry says there has to be some time-like geodesic that passes into this extension. Okay? But the, the curvature over here was, was blowing up as you approach there. Okay, and that contradicts that, okay, this is a C2 metric, so locally nothing should go wrong. Okay, so, uh, so that's what curvature blow up uh, means. It means that the metric is inextendable as a C2 metric. So, um, so it turns out that um, um, this uh, statement with observers being torn apart, uh, well, it's sort of difficult to directly translate because then you sort of uh, get into this issue of which observers, maybe there are some special observers that are oriented in some way. Such that but the, the claim is that the, the, the correct purely field theoretic interpretation of this okay, is the statement that the uh, metric uh, M4G is inextensible as a manifold with continuous metric. Okay? So, um, so if you want, this is a, so the sort of from the point of view of differentiability, this statement lives at the same level as this one. Uh, I claim that there, this, these are not equivalent statements, but in, in the spirit of what I told you, this is sort of the f purely field theoretic description that the singularity r equals zero of Schwarzschild or Oppenheimer Schneider is extremely strong. Okay? Okay? So it's sort of of the strength that destroys observers. Destroys. All right. So actually, um, uh, I, should, I, I should maybe even put a, an asterisk on this statement. So this statement is true about Schwarzschild, but it was only very recently uh, shown again by uh, Zbierski. Okay, let me say, I don't know, 2018. And I, I, I don't know it to have been shown actually for, for the interior of the star. So any bright young uh, student in the audience uh, might want to read Zbierski's paper and see if, if you can actually extend this C0, so continuous sometimes we C0, C0 and extendability to, to the interior of the star. Okay, because this is really the statement that um, sort of the, the, the singularity is strong. Okay, so, uh, so in particular, let me um, try to now interpret sort of this uh, uh, statement here, okay? So that uh, we, we see in the, let's say, the first part of the statement, okay? All right? That indeed all incompleteness, all incomplete um, um, geodesics, okay, they, they, they go to a singularity, all right? That, that's sort of the, this... Uh, informal uh, version of the statement, okay? But the more correct uh, version of the statement should be that there should be some obstruction to extending the spacetime. So spacetime may be incomplete, okay? But there should be some obstruction to extending it, okay? And what we see is that there is, first of all, the naive statement that indeed uh, the spacetime is inextensible as a manifold with C2 metric, okay? But there's actually a much, much stronger statement secretly there, okay? Which is that the spacetime is inextensible as a manifold with, with continuous metric. So, um, so let me um, now uh, spell it out for you and, and uh, sort of try to uh, interpret what I said here. Um, so, 
let me first say it in, in the language of observers, and then I'll say it in the pure field theoretic language. So uh, why is this telling us that GR uniquely predicts the classical fate of classical observers? And why am I focusing so much on this uh, destruction of observers as opposed to infinite curvature? So what's going on in this space-time? Well, there are two classes of observers, right? There are the observers who don't cross the event horizon, okay? And it turns out that these observers, they all live forever. This is related, of course, to this completeness that I claim is the, yeah, the way we, we, in the modern world, formulate weak cosmic censorship. So these observers live forever, and of course, the classical space-time is telling me everything about this observer. Okay? And then we have these yellow observers who only live for finite time and reach r equals zero. And what classical uh, uh, theory is telling me is that these observers as classical objects are actually torn apart. Okay? So even if you believe, and certainly uh, most people do, that sort of maybe very, very close to the end, we have to go beyond classical physics uh, to understand uh, sort of what happens in physics, as far as this observer is concerned, they have already been torn apart. They no longer exist as a classical object. They're now some quantum soup. And, okay, you can then use your uh, favorite uh, quantum theory of I don't know what to speculate what happens to that quantum soup. But as far as the classical physics is concerned, uh, classical physics has given up this classical observer to whatever is beyond classical physics, you know, as a non-classical object. So classical physics is, in this sense, self-contained. It, it tells you what happens to all classical objects. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, from, the, uh, from the PDE point of view, and let me just end with this comment, okay? So if I don't want to talk about observers, all right, then uh, I should go back to sort of just the, the, the initial value problem, okay, for my space time. So, again, given initial data, there is a unique object, this maximal Cauchy development, M, G. Okay? But the M, G, in what sense is it maximal? It is maximal as a globally hyperbolic Cauchy development. So no one says that that cannot be extended further, just not as a globally hyperbolic space-time. It is only maximal as a globally hyperbolic Cauchy development. We will see exactly the, I'm slightly behind, so we will see at the beginning of next time exactly in what way this can fail, for instance. Okay. So what we see here in this property Okay? is that this object, the maximal Cauchy development, is not just maximal as a Cauchy development, it is maximal in any reasonable sense of the word. There is no possible way to extend this. Okay? So in, in the sort of pure PD language, again, this is telling you that you know, this unique object, unique just by, by fiat, is really unique in any sense. It is the unique sort of classical object that we can associate to initial data, okay? So it is in this sense that this property represents determinism uh, in, in, in general relativity. Okay, so let me, let me uh, stop because I'm already two minutes over time uh, and we'll, we'll sort of, uh, maybe in the beginning of the next uh, lecture, I'll uh, explain, so I'll maybe draw this picture again and I'll explain the many ways in which these nice properties could have failed to happen Okay? And then we'll start in earnest discussing spherically symmetric spacetimes where we'll be able to make formal sense of this picture and sort of really sort of show what you, what you can prove. Okay, thanks. <laughs>